This presentation is going to be regarding embolic selection and techniques in the management of endoleaks, pulmonary AVMs, and aneurysms, a case-based presentation. And this is supported by an educational grant by Medtronic. My name is Aripal Gandhi. I'm from the Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute in Miami, Florida. And our faculty will be Brian Scherf from Riverside Radiology and Interventional Associates from Columbus, Ohio, Zeev Haskell from University of Virginia School of Medicine, and uh, Dr. Clifford Weiss from John Hopkins University School of Medicine. These are our disclosures. Now, our learning objectives for this program are to, one, identify the best possible embolic agent based on disease diagnosis and patient presentation, to compare and contrast risks associated with various embolic agents, and finally, to analyze patient cases that illustrate the management of endoleaks, pulmonary AVMs, and aneurysms to better apply the method of selection of embolic agents in daily practice. Now, we want to try to make this interactive if we can. Sometimes it's a little bit hard, but you know, this is a small enough room, and any time in the middle of the case or, or afterwards, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt us. So I think we're going to go ahead and move on to the first case. So I have the first case, and it's a case of an endoleak. So let me first show you what happened in the patient, and then we'll see what happens with the endoleak. So here's the initial endovascular aortic repair. It's an 80-year-old man with a 7-centimeter abdominal aortic aneurysm. Uh, neck is right up at the renal arteries. So you can see the device uh, um, amidst the deployment. And typical steps, nothing unexpected. Device is being uh, ballooned. Legs are being deployed and a couple of uh, stent grafts placed for the stenotic left renal artery and right renal artery. Here's the left, there's the stent graft, and the right, and then you notice something that's a little bit funny over the uh, shoulder there, um, just below the uh, right renal artery. So we'll close in on that. So there's some sort of endoleak, and it is presumably type 1 endoleak over the top. It was a long case at that point, so um, we thought, well, let's get some more pictures of it. It's a long day. Have a chance to come back because this is no longer balloon molding at this point with the uh, eye casts in place. So there are the images of the leak. So first question is, is it indeed a type 1 endo leak, or do we have to be thinking of anything else? Guys, do you disagree that it's a type 1? Not necessarily. I think on the basis of the imaging and the angiogram, it seemed like it was definitely suggestive of a type 1 endoleak. Yeah, so pretty bright, right over the top. There we are at the very top as well. And then we see that same contrast sort of milking its way down toward the bottom as well. So presumably the same process extending a little bit lower. So what do we say for approaches here? There are, I think there are a couple of approaches. You said balloon is out. You could theoretically do a direct stick try to embolize if you feel like you can't tap the front, the top up. Look above the top uh, edge of the graft and see about uh, coming from above, either coming from the groin or the arm is an approach. So peering over the top is one yeah. approach over there. So let's see what it looks like over the top. As you say, leaning up over the top with a reverse curve catheter. Zeeb, well, maybe we could take a step back here. I mean, you know, our, our initial approach for this would be, you know, maybe placing a palm os debt or endo anchors. You know, uh, why, why initially going straight to embolization, or I imagine maybe you tried those things. Yeah, I think it's a good question as to whether uh, there's a belief that a palma stent would work in this uh, angulated area over here and lean it down, and the thought was that it wasn't the way that the neck curved out over here. And uh, would an anchor tack it up against the wall over here? Perhaps, perhaps another, another approach certainly to consider. Um, and uh, I can't say that I... Um, can speak enough to the fact that an anchor would kick that graft over enough to hit that wall, but um, no harm, no foul in trying, certainly. So naturally, we're all aware that uh, using uh, embolization for type 1 endoleaks has been slowly growing as an alternative, controversial at the start, but there are increasing series that show that this is a viable and at least in the number of years that have been presented, durable approach to type 1 endoleaks, especially when the situation is a little bit tough. So, uh, there are a number of agents that could be used over here from embolization coils to liquids. And in this case, we're using EVOH. So you can see that uh, injecting it with a microcatheter that's extended uh, down 
and this little cloud starts to extend into a longer and longer slash across the front, or maybe it's better called a sash of, uh, <laughs> of, of onyx, if you will. Um, maybe nice we could take a um, poll from the audience. You know, how, how many of you are utilizing onyx for your uh, endoleak embolization procedures? Great. And maybe from the panel as well? Yeah. Yeah. So a good mix for, uh, for those of you watching from the outside, a fair number of the audience raise their hands as well. Uh, so, Sib, do you need to see the sash, or if you only had, you know, occlusion at the top, would you be happy with that? I think that's a great point, which is if we had stopped, and it's the very reason we have three slides over here, which is slide one is a promise, slide two is maybe a short-term contract, slide three feels like, you know, durable. You're married. <laughs> if you will. And yes, marri marriages can become dissolute, but there's a better sense of a durable union. So I think your point is that you want to push it a bit more yeah. and sort of go deeper into committing to it and filling it out because the nice thing about this particular agent, perhaps different than a, than a uh, dilute glue, is that you have time to push it and to spread it because it's not adhesive. So excellent point. And that would be a failure of coils as well because there's the risk of stopping too far at the top. Now, coils and onyx mix very well in terms of you know, making a, a dense, sticky net. Not sure we've all used them to sort of finish out coils otherwise. But here, I think um, your point's a solid one. And we're looking pretty happy over there. It's wearing the victory sash for the beauty contest. And we're uh, about to declare victory. And then there's this little tail over there that rears its head at the bottom of the... Uh, See, maybe you can make a comment on how many vials of onyx did you use and which onyx were you using? Uh, that was 18, and I have no uh, recollection of the amount. Great. So this is an image at the same time of the, is this the same procedure? Or? Same procedure. Just a temporal <laughs> image a little bit later in the same arteriogram. I showed you that we're done, and always that saying, which is quick, take the picture fast before you get the next one that shows that maybe you're not done. That picture was just a second later, and there was uh, um, more filling of some sort of uh, endoleak over there, as we see, or incomplete filling of the type 1, however you want to call it. So now the hunt is for another contribution. And uh, this is uh, uh, Brian's point originally, that in fact you may have a transarterial approach to this as well, and now we're actually treating this as a type 2 endoleak, and you can see the retrograde filling into that sac from the lumbar film from the left, from the right side as well. So this is a two for one, if you will, in which case this is now the type two contribution to that same endo leak filled with onyx from the backside. And I don't know that further filling, to your point, from the top, had we gotten further down, might have gotten that, but it looks like about four more centimeters would have probably reached that lumbar and we would have never known that it was a type two or not. And if you'd stopped at the top, you would have had a more difficult case from below. Because we'd have to go backwards up the hill, if you will, as well. Was, so. was the IMA uh, open uh, and a contributor to this at all? Uh, IMA or? did not contribute to okay. this. And what, what was your end point, um, you know, in terms of the type 2 embolization? At what point did you decide to stop? Packing back to the lumbar that you can see has been filled over here. So it's the endoleak happening to meet the top one, but that wasn't necessarily a criteria. You can see a little bit of back filling into other parts of it as well, and then this lumbar. So it's the, it's the, uh, the, Nile, the source of the Nile all the way to the delta, if you will. You know, for the treatment of type 2 endoleaks, we certainly uh, favor onyx as, as it is a great embolic agent, and you know, our kind of general thought process is to try to treat it like an AVM, you know, what, try to get the inflow, the outflow, and especially the nidus. Um, this was, you know, I guess initially a type 1 with the type 2, but I think the goal would still be the same here. Uh, any comments on that? Oh, I think that's a, a, an excellent approach. It's, um, the, the concept of anitis is not, obviously not an AVM, but the idea that there's a complexity to it, and there mean multiple branches, and they have to be sealed at multiple sources. If you can't get the junction box at the center, is a good way to approach all endoleaks. They're not just one door in and we're done. Uh, and these pictures also emphasize the value of cone beam CT in a case like this as well, and the ability to get on-table CT if you don't have a combined room. And I think more and more of us might be looking as we build new buildings to put combined CT together with. But certainly, cone beam CT on-table is, is as invaluable here as it is in I.O. applications. 
Maybe you could uh, present a question to the panel. You know, one of the qu issues that I've definitely encountered in treating type 2 endoleaks is sometimes you just can't get the microcatheter to the site of the endoleak. You know, maybe a very tortuous iliolumbar artery. And you know, what, are, what are your experiences in utilizing onyx in those cases? Do you have to actually get into the actual you know, nidus sac, or can you treat more proximally? And how, how do you deal with those cases? Well, I'll let you, I'll let you start with that, actually. Um, so the, um, the neuroradiologist who began with, uh, with onyx, which is, uh, of course, approved for intracerebral ABMs, uh, are the most patient sorts of practitioners where um, they'll spend a tremendous amount of time slowly injecting on it's almost a different personality than interventional radiologists or most endovascular specialists and what they've demonstrated is you can fill and push this material to incredible distances you can fill the entire um, lima with an AVM and all its ramifying branches with onyx beautifully casting it. But we have to take a different mindset then. We're filling it, we're caulking this, and moving on. So to your point, you can, with that patient technique, build that beautiful onion skin and move forward. The alternative would have to be dilute glue, and dilute glue will, will flow forward, but there isn't that certainty that you can take your time and do that. Uh, it's, it's all in one up at the front versus relax, continue, push, etc. So there is that there is that upside to this agent. And that, that the nature of that is because the center is molten, like liquid still, while the outer rim starts to harden. So you can actually push through that. You know, a couple other strategies that we've utilized for cases like that are one is we've actually deployed a microvascular plug and then push the microcatheter distal to it. So then it serves, serves as a backstop and then push the glue out. Another thing uh, that we've utilized is a sniper balloon, which is a small microcatheter with the balloon. Problem with it is that a little, it's a little bit bigger than some of the microcatheters we would typically use for onyx, but uh, you could deploy that balloon and again it serves as a backstop and you could try to get your onyx out a little bit further. So just additional strategies to consider. That, yeah, that would, balloon is also DMSO compatible. Correct, correct. It's and just I, a little I bit would, bigger uh, than you know, some of the other microcatheters that we might use. So that's, so, so that, so again to emphasize that, that's a proximal occlusion uh, to prevent backflow so you can push it forward simply by the pressure of injection. Correct. And you can do that in a, I, I've done that large varices where there are large flows and you can imagine that in, in uh, arteriovenous shunts in other places as well where it may even be a five French balloon and a catheter through that to provide a, a, a trailing occlusion to push forward. Great point. So uh, obvious conclusions that we've, got, we've come to, which is not having a, a fixed idea as to what the nature of it is or being flexible on the, on the fly. Endoleaks can be mixed. There's, uh, uh, there certainly could have been coils, embolization <coughs> coils that have to be small and flexible to get into the distance here. And I don't think anybody would be faulted for perhaps coiling the top with a rim of coils. It's been described, but this at least unearths an example of why the, the um, uh, the culprit may in fact be deeper and may require more work and might have proved more difficult if we had just stopped to cap the top. Have you had any issues following these patients after onyx embolization? I mean, certainly with any of these embolics that we use except for, you know, I think the microvascular plug and some of the Medusa coils, you know, most of these produce some artifact. What's your experience in following a patient after onyx embolization? Well, we know that there are reduced uh, uh, opacity formulations available outside of the U.S. and it would be great to see this agent on label in the U.S. and with the reduced opacity versions. I think that would be a great advantage to U.S. physicians as well just for that self-same reason. Yeah, we, we followed some of these patients with MR and it, you know, eliminates the artifact uh, uh, depend, depending on the graft that you used. I think, I think you had a cook graft there which can create some problems there. but. Now, I haven't seen any literature, but it's possible that a dual source CT could also help reduce some of those artifacts as well. But I there's no literature on that, actually. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. Interesting idea. All right, maybe we'll move on to the next case. Uh, any questions from the audience before we move on to the next case? <coughs> So the question was, how do we how do we get into the lumbar and that was, uh, to treat the uh, type 2 endoleak? And that was uh, from the right iliac artery retrograde up to the iliolumbaris, and then a long hike with a tiny macrocatheter back <coughs> around the turn. So very often for something like that, I'll lean on an echelon, some, the same catheter that I'd use for a, a peripheral SMA bleeding branch that's going to be able to get out there and use small caliber coils. Same thing. 
yeah, we favor the Echelon as well. I think it's very, very trackable, and it is you know, DMSO compatible as well. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and move on to the next case. If there's, we have one, oh, there's more. One, one, one more question. Yeah, sorry about that. Can you repeat any the question? Any problem with Onyx recanalization? He, he asked if there's any problem with Onyx recanalization. Like a bat. bat. Uh, so in our experience, we haven't had any issues with Onyx recanalization. It actually has worked pretty well for these type 2 endo leaks. Uh, this one is more of a type 1 slash type 2 endo leak. But uh, other experiences with them? Yeah. The biggest risk is, of course, arcing during surgery with a bipolar electrode, right? So you have to let the surgeons know you've, you, you, that you've used Onyx and not glue, because there are reports of arcing. The one thing that I Onyx. have noticed is sometimes, you know, you get, when you inject the DMSO initially, I've had patients complain of pain, um, but once you, once you get the uh, Onyx in there, the patient does it right. So for the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and move on uh, to the next case. Uh, I think uh, this is going to be a case that uh, Dr. Scherf uh, from uh, Riverside is going to be presenting. Thank you. So this is a uh, interesting Sunday night case. Uh, there are my disclosures, and then we're going to speak about a little off-label use of uh, Onyx. Um, in the uh, current year with the flu, uh, this is a patient from last year that presented at an outside hospital, 72-year-old gentleman, uh, very short of breath, satting in the 70s. He was in AFib, which he'd had intermittent episodes of before with RVR, and he tested positive for H1M1 uh, strain. Like many ER patients, they, he received a PE study, which didn't show a pulmonary embolus, but on the bottom, a uh, few slices, what looked like a aneurysm in the upper abdomen, and he was uh, transferred to our institution for an eight and a half centimeter uh, splenic aneurysm, which is probably the largest I've seen in a while. And uh, he was seen by cardiology as well because uh, they wanted to cardioverte him, and, but that would require him being in it coagulated. Uh, some of these patients, if otherwise healthy with a distal large uh, splenic aneurysm, you may want to consider surgery, uh, but uh, he wasn't the ideal operative candidate, especially on a Sunday night. Uh, the left image uh, is the coronal reformat, if you could cue that back up again, uh, showing the uh, anatomy, his aorta actually is a good for approach from below, so sometimes you want to consider doing this from a radial or brachial approach. Uh, and then we have the uh, 3D volume rendered image over there, MIP, showing the anatomy. So everyone on the panel, any initial thoughts when you're staring at this? Send him home, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering when, when would this kind of patient ever be an ideal surgical candidate? <laughs> Pretty much the case. You'd be embolizing under any circumstances. I think you could say when would this patient ever be allowed to go to surgery, what, ideal or not, yeah. would they ever take this patient to sure. surgery? Impressive, yeah. very impressive, yeah. I, I, think you're gonna, I think you have a, I mean, one, one question, you know, clearly what you're going to address is, is you have a giant diverting sac right in the middle of your, it's not a small sac, this is enormous. Correct. Getting it, getting across, it's going to be a challenge, and that's why I'm going to, you know. It's I, yes, fishing. Yes. Fly fishing. Yes. In a, in a vacuum in space. <clears throat> I think the other thing I would want to know, I think, I don't know if it's 100 percent clear, Judge. I would want to make sure that there's no fish there as well. Um, Good point. I didn't, I didn't see any early venous drainage, but something that could complicate the procedure for sure. Absolutely. So we have the aortogram over here on the uh, left, as you see. This is uh, which one's the kidney, right? It's bigger than the kidney. <laughs> and what's, what's even more uh, exciting is where are the outflow splenic artery branches? It's really hard to see. This was a large volume uh, injection. I think it was 15 for 45, just to see if we could see it. And then this is the selective uh, picture. Again, we're not really seeing maybe a little wisp of an outflow there. Um, so we moved on and went a little uh, further down uh, the rabbit hole. And uh, as you can see, I think from this one, you'll see a little bit of the outflow over here. Uh, but it doesn't look like it enhances the whole spleen. Uh, but additionally, I'll point out the looped five French catheter here. So uh, putting a large, in my mind, thinking an eight French sheath or something where you're going to put an amplitzer plug in the proximal inflow is not going to be ideal. Uh, so we're looking at 
getting into the sack and seeing if we can see any distal branches. And fortunately, after spending a little time, uh, we was able to get into this segmental uh, branch with a track seal, a seven French uh, sheath, and this is a five French catheter, and uh, luckily got in. That's um, pretty impressive. It, it was get, getting into that outflow, I agree with uh, Cliff. I think that was probably the most challenging portion of the case. And one of the things that we found to be occasionally helpful is doing rotational angio on the table to try to find that right obliquity yeah. that might help you. Uh, did you have any, any tips or tricks in uh, getting into this branch? Uh, that would have been something we, we should have done probably, uh, but fortunately I got into this uh, a little easier than I thought and uh, just with a glide wire and uh, I was actually surprised, so. Lucky that essentially it led you over <laughs> it around the top because coming off anywhere front or back from the other side and exactly. you'd be looking for a single seat. I hula uh, hooped into the correct yeah. plane. So before, so before you go on and, and, and show how you finish, let's say you couldn't get into the distal. What would you think, what would we do? Let's say you just got stuck. You could get into the proximal, you couldn't get into the... I don't think you can fill that sack. I agree. I mean, there, there isn't enough material, and, and starting on the task of filling that sack is a fruitless errand. Right. You know, with the smaller sack, you know, I think, you know, there are things, you know, we could use glue or other things, hopefully, to shut down the back door and then embolize proximally with eight centimeters. Pretty large. I mean, I know sometimes with larger aneurysms, we've taken Benson wires and thrown them in, but so eight centimeters, I think it's a lot of volume to fill, I guess, theoretically possible. And, and I would resist the use of thrombin under any and all circumstances. I just want to say my opinion of thrombin and visceral aneurysms is now for the history books, primarily. <laughs> so uh, we uh, attempted to coil off the outflow here. See, here's, but as you see, we're missing a significant portion of the spleen, so I know we haven't uh, captured all the distal outflow. We'll come back to that later. Uh, on the image on your left, uh, just to show the sort of instability of catheter positioning, uh, this is a uh, concerto coil. This is an MVP plug out here distally and a few concerto coils. And this is a, uh, another concerto coil, but uh, it's very kind of unstable position as you can see the microcatheter flopping around because then the microcatheter is looped around here as well in another branch. So not an ideal deployment, but this gentleman also had the flu and he was coughing and I was watching his diaphragm slap this aneurysm during the whole case. So we just <laughs> deployed that where it was uh, and moved on and I was able to get into this other branch and we had a uh, nice, nice dense control packing, packing yeah. uh, there. And then uh, this is the final. So what, what is all this in the front end? And you couldn't resist throwing a few wires into it anyway. That's right. <laughs> I, I couldn't resist. We, we had to go Did you actually it. just put the entire guide wire in? Uh, those are two Benson yeah. wires that are in there. <laughs> so I did throw a few 035 uh, coils in here uh, from Turmo and Cook, and they as expectedly flew in. I knew there was still another outflow branch that we were probably going to have to come back and treat later on. Uh, uh, we did not have a removable mandrel uh, of Benson wire, so I just cracked it and pulled the inner stylets out uh, and then deployed pieces of that. Not really to fill the sack, but just to get something that would allow me to pack the proximal uh, inflow. Incidentally, we had a, a new tech working that night who then reported me to the radiology manager that I had left wires in the patient. <laughs> so that was, that was a bonus of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, I get written up for lots of other things, so that was at least uh, cute. But uh, so in the in the rest of the inflow here, there's a nine millimeter uh, MVP in this nest, and then a, a few concertos to pack around that, and then a few uh, uh, pushable uh, coils. And this is the uh, sort of final. You run. hadn't tried to reduce that loop by any chance at that point, right? You were just happy to have gotten around. Just happy to get around. Yep. Yeah. So so we're dismissing the idea of a scent graft here because of multiple branches and because that really wasn't ever going to reduce that Correct. what led you into it, that beautiful circle. Correct. Yeah. And then if you could cue that uh, one again, what you'll see, uh, what we were hoping to see, and I thought we saw on the CTA before, is a good filling of short gastrics across. This is a different branch. And so he's perfusing a little bit. He did get the triple vaccine uh, before we started the case uh, to make sure he was covered for encapsulated bacteria but we knew he was going to have some sort of uh, splenic infarct. How do you tolerate this? 
uh, uh, surprisingly well. Uh, he was anticoagulated, uh, cardioverted, uh, survived his flu uh, uh, episode, uh, went home, and I saw him back uh, with a short-term CTA, and uh, put the video this should here. play here. So there's clearly an endo leak there. Uh, there's significant streak artifact from the, the coils and the beds and wires. And as you see, his spleen is growing smaller. Uh, the aneurysm sac is the same size, so it's still eight and a half centimeters. So there's still significant, I think, pressure in there from the endo leak. Um, what would you do at this point on the panel? I think this is Brian's point for percutaneous at this point. Absolutely. I think a percutaneous would be fine. I mean, another thing to consider, although I think I, I would definitely favor treating this patient, but if this was a patient with an abdominal aortic aneurysm and we say it's a type 2 endolite, we might even watch it. But given, given the size of this, I think all of us would likely like to treat this. Yeah, and he, he was also put on Coumadin for his AFib after this, uh, even though he cardioverted out and was still on it. Uh, could you cue that one up again? So the image on your left is a... Uh, uh, we have a CT hybrid room, so I just did this in there, and, and this is an 18-gauge needle angled very extremely up into the, uh, into, through the thrombus. So long, out-of-plane access. Long, uh, very fun, enjoyable, up. essentially in the chest. And, uh, and then this is our, just the angiogram through there, and there's the surviving uh, segmental branch. And so at this point, uh, I put a few uh, concerto coils, and then we moved on to uh, a liquid embolic. We used a combination of 18 and 34, uh, just so it didn't flow too far out into that segmental so branch. Were you injecting through the needle? Uh, I usually put a lure lock uh, uh, or a tui borscht on the needle, and then have uh, and then with an extension to it, so that I'm not near the field. And then I'd run a microcatheter through that. I just read a paper from uh, some Greek authors of a large endoleak series in which they were doing direct stick and injecting dilute glue directly through the needle. That's what we do, actually. We so do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll do onyx through the needle as well. I think my concern there would be if you, if you occlude that, you lost your access, if you use a microcatheter and you know, run into an issue, pull it out and you know, put in another, another catheter. But, you know. I hear you. And when I've done detachables like this for direct sticks, I'll use, I, I'm sorry, uh, percutaneous embolization of a, of a visceral aneurysm, I've used detachable coils. Mm -hmm. So you have one person with a tenaculum holding the needle or whatever the introducer is in place so that their hand isn't in the field because you can't tell whether the thing moves up and down and you fall out, and we've seen those fallouts. And then someone relaxed in a back position pushing coils, and then the whole situation becomes quieter than trying to kind of jam it on the front and watch it. So good points. And on the way out, uh, and this is one of the reasons why we use a microcatheter through less This is an 18-gauge needle, and then I used a few uh, Cook O35 pushables uh, through the thrombus and along the edge of the uh, uh, aneurysm. Here's his uh, year follow-up. I just saw him in the office. There's, the aneurysm is smaller. Uh, there's no real endoleak. There's a lot of streak artifact from the onyx. He's clinically doing well, though he says every now and then he gets some cramping on his left upper quad. A little bit of profuse spleen in the corner there as well. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, are, are we sure that there's no filling here? Uh, you know, one of the issues... It's hard to tell. Yeah, an MR. I mean, it would be worth getting an MR. You know, we, we looked at our own institutional experience on visceral aneurysms a few years ago, and, you know, Zeev kept rejecting the paper. Actually, it was one of the reviewers uh, <laughs> who kept saying, how do you know? How do you know that there's no filling? Uh, because of all the artifact, and most of our follow-up was CT, and honestly, they were right. We didn't know that, but we did know that they were still alive. So that's how it was eventually published. But you know, this becomes an issue with pretty much a lot of these embolics that we used. And I think the agent that Zeev suggested, you know, an onyx without radio opacity or less radio opacity, could be very helpful in these cases. Um, but at least it's, get, it's getting smaller. It's getting smaller, so we, we assume that the pressure in the sac is uh, uh, Call for old fast and ultrasound as well. You probably try that or, or can in some of these. I think another interesting um, consideration <coughs> I would like to hear from the panel is, you know, you know getting into the outflow again, uh, probably the most difficult thing, you know, you're able to get into it. How about doing it, if you couldn't get into that, doing a trans, you know, we're doing transplenic, you know, portal recanalizations, how about doing a transplenic uh, access to the outflow artery and embolizing the back door and the, uh, and the front door, any thoughts, experiences? Uh, we haven't done that, but I, I think that's a good approach. I, 
I had a complicated uh, common hepatic artery aneurysm a few years ago that ever went into the stomach, and the patient was exsanguinating, and we couldn't get it. I could get out into the stomach, but and through the common, but I couldn't get into the other. Fortunately, did, but we were prep. I could still see the hepatic branches, and that we were going to consider puncturing the hepatic artery intrahepatic to go across and, and, and then stent, stent craft that area acutely. Now, Riyadh Salem good. reported a, cor, uh, a uh, hepatic embolization, um, arterial embolization, uh, hepatic artery. There have been some papers for transgluteal prostate artery embolization with occlusions and such. So your point about retrograde access into the artery through the organ is absolutely possible. It's a great point to bring up. Any questions from the audience before we move on to our last case? Yes. Well, I said it to be, so the, the, the question was, why did I dismiss thrombin? And obviously, I made a strong statement to create some controversy as well. But I will say that uh, I, uh, these uh, aneurysms often have other branches that aren't visible, as you demonstrated as well. And in the face of that, you say, I've got the one branch, and yet <coughs> they're going to be short gastrics. And same for SMA branches. And I've seen enough cases over the years that people have shown where the direct injection of thrombin into the unreachable SMA or other branches have resulted in bowel ischemia or retrograde filling or flow in, retrograde flow into the kidney and even some lethal examples of such. So I think in as much as we have positive visible embolization versus unknown and uncertainty help it along value of thrombin, I'd, I'd lean toward image guided. Sure. Uh, so the question was, when you use a needle and microcatheter, what, what type of needles? So I would not use a, a cutting tip needle. So it's a needle that the st center stylet comes out so you don't have a cutting tip. Because if you're moving the microcatheter around, you could shear, shear it off, which we've probably all done. Uh, and then for this, I, I tend to use a, a Renegade Micro, although you can use an Echelon. A Renegade is not officially D DMSO or Onyx approved, but in my experience works just fine. O O2 one correct. Regular Renegade. 18 gauge needle, and then there's a Tui Borsch, I don't know the exact name of it, but it comes with an extension tubing off the front end of it, so that I have that attached to the needle, so that I'm working with the Tui Borsch off to the side of the of the. So uh, key IR. point in all of this is to test it on the table, is to have dry tested the fit, the ability to slide. If the catheter is sticky, do you still have some room so it's not going to bind up? Plan out the ability to inject out of the floral field to your point Correct. of the sidearm and such as well. And, and test Lots the dead space in your system, right? If you're building a system with a big sidearm with a with a with an extension tubing, there's probably 20 different extension tubings. And knowing your dead space is really important so that you're not really just kind of pushing an unknown volume of, of embolic. Right. If you're going to inject directly through the needle, that's very important. You want to check that beforehand. And that's, I think, uh, our tend to use microcatheters for that so that you know exactly. And the dead space on the re regular Renegade is about 0.45, I believe. ML. And then your dead space in your tubing can be anywhere from 0.3 cc's with a short, thin extension tubing all the way up to whole cc numbers. So we're really going to kind of get a sense of what your whole system looks like. For the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and move on uh, to the final case. Uh, Cliff Weiss uh, from uh, Hopkins is going to be uh, presenting a case on pulmonary AVM. So, as always, I have way too many slides in the wrong format, so just interrupt as you want. Um, I want to say thank you to uh, Chris Bailey and Sally Mitchell, who provided me with a lot of uh, great slides and insight. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, and uh, we're going to just talk a little bit about pulmonary AVM treatment. So this is actually a 14-year-old young man with a, a history of twice a week epistaxis who came to his primary uh, pediatrician and was found to have clubbing on exam. And then when they put a, a, ox, a saturation device on his, on his finger, they found that he was actually satting at 68% to low 70s on room air. And um, he plays lacrosse and found that when he would run 10 feet, he'd have to stop and take a breath. Um, he went sent, thankfully, to the emergency department, where he was actually found to be relatively small for his age. Uh, had severe clubbing, blue, blue lips, and blue fingers. And on room air, we found it would be around 70%, but we could only bump him to 83%, no matter how much oxygen we gave him. Uh, he was tachycardic, a relatively high re respiratory rate, and clearly was producing too many red blood cells. He was not dehydrated. 
and had kind of a, a VBG, which is not you know, our strong suit, that shows kind of a chronic hypoxic picture. Um, being in the emergency department, they got a chest x-ray, and that was called round pneumonia versus potential vascular malformation. So he got a CAT scan. I don't even know why we get a chest x-ray anymore. And uh, he was shown to have multiple pulmonary AVMs, including a very, very large left lower lobe pulmonary AVM. Uh, and although the radiologist didn't, diagnostic radiologist didn't read it, it had a feeding vessel of around 1 to 1.2 uh, centimeters. Uh, a nice reconstruction showing that this may be a little more complex than we expect in terms of that large AVM. So he went right to angiography. And you can see the initial angiogram is, is terrifying. So a couple things to note. Um, I had the anesthesiologist with a great discussion give me a dual lumen and a tracheal tube. So he has actually a left main stem bronchus um, with a balloon on it, right? So that's actually a separate lumen from the main. So in case we lost this lung, he could inflate the balloon, we could send him to thoracic surgery, or I could, take the, I could actually embolize the lung. And what you see here is massive shunting from the uh, entire lobe down through this massive pulmonary AVM. Um, it was actually measured using a measuring wire. And I should note that it actually took us a long time to cross because of some narrowing of his native vessels. So we actually used a tip deflecting wire and a pediatric pigtail to get across his valve and up into his pulmonary arteries. Cliff, Cliff maybe you could, we could stop right there. You know, yeah. why, why, why were you concerned? You know, I mean, you, you, had, you asked the anesthesiologist um, you know, to do this special incubation for you. Have you had experiences where you've had significant bleeding or other complications during these procedures? So I, we personally in our practice have not, and we do a two or three cases, or if not four, a week of pulmonary AVM. Um, however, this, the larger your pulmonary AVM, the scarier and the more risky it is in for potential rupture. It is one of the reasons why the goals of pulmonary embolization is actually embolized within a centimeter of the actual pulmonary AVM and not to go for the sac itself because of risk of rupture. We knew in this case we had a risk that if this did go, though, we would lose this patient within minutes, within, within seconds. What is the reason for the rupture? It's actually would be a rupture of the aneurysm or the fistula sac itself as you're deploying a, uh, a coil. But in this case, if a wire, you know, had slipped into the, into the sac that what we were not comfortable with, there's a risk it could rupture. And this is far larger than any pulmonary distal vessel should be. So I, I'm not aware of a rupture occurring like yeah. this, but I can imagine your concern just because of both wall tension and any of us who had a wire, even a glide wire, out in a pulmonary artery know that just the end of it hits the branch and you can rupture and suddenly there's just hemoptysis in the room. So. Boy Scott motto. Again, you know, safety first. So we decided to do that. It took nothing but a fiber optic scope. Um, and so what you see here is the Amplatzer plug has been deployed. Now, I would argue well, this is a 16 millimeter Amplatzer II, um, one of the larger ones we carry that looked like it would fit for a one centimeter vest. We've oversized by about 50%. But I'd argue it's still not really very oversized. The ends look like barbells. It isn't really stretched. Uh, we also didn't have that much room without taking out more of the lungs. So that's what we were stuck with. But it ended up being it had more feeders. So it was actually a complex or plexiform AVM. So we actually came back in uh, from above and deployed a 12 millimeter amplatzer. And I, I think if we look at the final versus comparison from this one embolization, we brought his oxygen saturation from 70 to almost 92% on room air. Um, and what you look now is the lung is now perfusing. And of course, oh, we have a few friends that have shown up. He's got a number of other pulmonary AVMs in the lower lobe. And I'll, I'll mention. Uh, an interesting port that I read from Japan, a couple in which people have actually uh, taken microcatheters and entered the larger AVP plugs and packed them yeah. with coils. And that's to prevent long-term recanalization. Well, th they had incomplete uh, occlusion at the time of the case after 15 minutes, so they essentially filled the amplatzer with coils. And and one, of, one of the solutions to that now, of course, is use a covered plug, like an MVP, which goes up to 9 millimeters. Anecdotally, we've seen a few cases of uh, amplatzer plugs which have recanalized. Uh, have, you, have, you, have you guys seen that in your own practices? Yes. Been reported with virtually every pulmonary AVM device. In our study, we showed about a 14% recanalization from AVP. Um, his pr pulmonary pressures, as expected, were normal, and his cardiac output was normal as well. Um, after the placement, we got a CT pretty soon, especially after an amplatzer, which we think isn't quite oversized enough. And what you see is the AVPs are in place. We have thrombosis and, and, and shrinkage of the pulmonary AVM. 
and we see an evolving pulmonary infarct with almost in days of that, which we expect with a massive pulmonary AVM, and multiple, uh, multiple others. He had multiple brain AVMs as well, and when you actually looked at him when we actually ready to discharge him, and we did send him home after this. We could do the rest as an outpatient. He had an SpO2 of 93% in room air, multiple brain AVMs, no other viscerals, and when you talked with his father, his, his, his father's brother actually had a known diagnosis of HHD, which no one bothered to mention to his son or to anybody else in the family. So clearly this guy is diagnosed with HHT by the Curacao criteria. So that, that's where we start with this case. Where it ends is we bring him back a number of times, and we actually keep embolizing. So we embolize with MVP and with Amplatzer 4, depending on the size of the vessel, and you can see on this one embolization we clear up a lot of his, his right lower lobe. And, by the, and we use coils as well when we don't have a long enough landing zone. And in the end, we use 31 uh, PAVMs with 38 embolics are actually used. Wow. A mixture of coils, detachable coils, AVP, MVP, and he's 98% on room air. He actually has a growth spurt in the middle of this and is no longer clubbing in blue. And he actually plays uh, lacrosse and crew, even though I'm strongly urging him not to play lacrosse because of his numerous cerebral AVMs. Have you, what is your experience with microvascular plugs? Have you seen recanalizations of pulmonary AVMs after deployment of MVPs? Right, so that's, that's so I think it, the distinction between this is pretty important. So we believe that we use detachable devices for everything in, in the pulmonary arteries. Um, we don't want paradoxical emboli. 15% of your blood volume goes to the brain. Having a stroke when you don't have one already is really unacceptable for us. Um, we found in a 360-something day follow-up so far, because it is the youngest agent, we have zero percent recanalization using MVP. But again, youngest agent, shortest, shortest follow-up period. In seven, 800 days for the other devices, around a 12 to 16 percent recanalization with both coils and, 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 and AVP. I have no idea what will happen if we wait another 365 days, nor because at this point, the sevens and the nines were not available. So we only used three, what, three to five and one to three millimeter MVP. The one thing I will say is with MVP, we, we, we try to match the size of the vessel, whereas with AVP, we oversize 30 to 50%. With coils, we want a nice dense pack. So we don't want to see, we want to get it also oversized 30 to 50%. With the, with the MVP, we match the size of the vessel or even undersize a little bit to let that umbrella open. If the umbrella doesn't open, it doesn't stop the rain. You've got to get the umbrella all the way open. In the I would place. absolutely echo that. Yeah. I've had some cases where I didn't match perfectly or it may be deployed around a slight curve, and I'm assuming that it's going around the pleats of the umbrella. Right. So, so matching that fit and measuring is, is essential for this device to do its very best. And trying to keep it straight also. I think that's um, a really important point. If you, you know, our experience is if you deploy it on a curve sometimes they're still filling the vessel. And, and you can loop a nice coil right around the top of the umbrella, and it'll actually take care of the extra if you need to. Yep. For those of you who are not familiar with the microvascular plug, one of the really nice things about it is you can actually inject contrast uh, around the microcatheter before deployment. If you don't like where it is, you could pull it back. You really can't do that with any other uh, plug or coil which goes through a microcatheter. So I have many more slides we can discuss, we can keep going. I just, I have an, some slides on, on thoughts about training pulmonary AVMs. Let's, let's, grab it. let's, yeah. uh, let's go back to the embolization thing. So yeah. one of the things you stated, and I think, which is one of the tenets in classic teaching is to embolize the proximal vessel of a pulmonary AVM Correct. as close to the nidus as possible. But I have seen a couple reports in the literature over the last couple of years about actually embolizing, embolizing the nidus itself with potentially better outcomes. Any thoughts on that? Any experience with that? I think it's a great idea. I think we have different embolics than we used initially. Remember, initially the recommendation was three millimeter or greater feeding vessel. We now do smaller than that. Um, our tools change, right? So as the tools change, practice has to change. I think as long as you have a device you have control of so that you're not gonna lose that device to systemic circulation, there's no real harm. I think in this case, I would be worried um, in that it was such a massive AVM that I really could disrupt that wall. Sometimes in these very large lower low pulmonary AVMs, I will suggest that patients may even go for partial pneumonectomy afterwards because I've seen recanalization from other sites and those become really challenging. They can come from the celiac, from the phrenics. These will actually start to parasitize, I would imagine, from the ischemia in the affected lobe. Can you maybe describe uh, to people who don't do a lot of these procedures, I know you, you, know, you have an HHT center, 
some of the basics during the procedure, you know, in terms of preventing, you know, air or using sure. a filter or you're anticoagulating the patient? What I'll do is I'll skip through to that slide because there's some nice pictures. This is just an overview of pulmonary AVMs in general. Um, so wh when you consider it, basically, um, we, we, we always want to look for a couple of things. So this whole system should be underwater. One of the things we don't want to do is have an air bubble pop through the AVM and create a problem. Most of it will go to the body, but some will go to the brain. And so what we do actually is we use 0.2 micron air filters and two bores serially loaded up, and everything's hooked up to controlled pumps. So basically, everything's cleared. There's no air. Very rarely are you ever actually sh exposing the system to air. Everything's wet to wet with double flushes as if you were doing neuro work. And of course, everything's underwater. Um, whenever you cross, the right atrium and right ventricle, especially if you're going to leave um, what we use the Lumax white set by Cook, um, you're going to want to make sure that the left bundle is in, intact, and working. If it's not, you can go from a left bundle branch block to a complete heart block, in which case you can float a pacer, but you should know that in advance. And then for all of my patients, I like to heparinize, but when you have two or three nosebleeds a week, you can actually start to have a significant nosebleed on the table. So what we'll do in those cases is we'll have a very high strength afferent available or we won't actually do any heparin at all, which is why that flushing becomes even more important as you cross and sit in front of a pulmonary AVM. And then, as in all cases, these patients get at least one dose, if not multiple doses of antibiotics before and after the case to make sure that we're not seeding and creating actually a, a brain aneurysm. That's pretty much the majority careful technique, underwater, heparin yes or no, and watch for that left ventral branch block. Have you ever lost a coil? We've never a lost plug. a coil. That's why we only use, so that's why we only use detachment. When I was a resident, and I was doing these as a resident uh, and as a medical student, the only detachment we had was the GDC, which was an exercise in extraordinary patience for an interventional radiologist, is to wait for these GDCs to slowly separate using electromechanical dissociation. Now what you use is everything is mechanical. You, you twist and off it pops. Uh, and that's a patience thing, I think, more than anything and not patients, but personal patients. As we have you know, only about a minute and a half left, I want to see if there's any questions from the audience. It's a generally, I, I'm, we're not really worried about resolution as much as lack of flow after the embolization. They will start to involute. I will fully expect that that large pulmonary AVM will be there for his entire life as a structure. But as long as there's no flow through the structure, you're not going to get paradoxical emboli through the structure, right? And so, um, you know, we will typically follow these patients with a baseline CT um, one to three months after the embolization. And then depending on how many pulmonary AVMs and their underlying telangiectasia and AVM pathology, uh, we may follow them every, every three to five years with a CT to follow up. Uh, in a single solitary pulmonary AVM, we may follow them once or twice in five-year CTs and then say, you're, you know, you're, you're dismissed. The other thing you can do, if you've actually cleared a patient of their pulmonary AVMs, now this is an extreme case, right? Um, a normal patient with a pulmonary AVM may have one. An HHT patient may have a handful. <coughs> and once you clear them, you can also follow them with bubble study echoes, right? So you can look for shunt based on an echocardiogram instead. And I'd call out a, a, a Japanese paper in the last couple of years in JVR that provides a specific MRA protocol in which they were detecting recanalization in some cases and not. So another way to follow PAVMs um, in young patients without radiation. So, so the literature reports the highest recanalization with coils. And I believe it has to do with coil pack density and the fact that a lot of our data is coming from a number of years ago before we had the ability to really densely pack our coils in there. Um, pl Amplats or plugs have, a, have, a, have a, a lower rate of recanalization by the literature uh, than do the uh, coils. And right now, no one's reported uh, a recanalization with MVP. It's the newest device. So I, I, we like the MVP because we find that by the time you're done deploying a handful of detachable coils, you might as well spend the money on the MVP. It's a one-and-done situation. And we've seen no recanalization in a year 
but that, of course, is the shortest follow-up. So plugs are, are, are relatively quick. Plugs in general have a lower recanalization rate across the board than coils. And for a very large pulmonary AVM like that, it's an incredibly controlled delivery. And, and I, will, I will boost on that. So if I'm using a plug because the vessel's too big to accommodate an MVP, I'm always putting coils behind that plug for that very reason, because there have been recanalization shown. So the, the days of looser packing and it'll block off and stay blocked are behind us for virtually anything that we're filling, and the PAVM is the same thing. I do, because of this very concern that uh, Dr. Weiss mentioned. We don't. We drop, we, we drop primarily, when we're dropping an Amplatzer plug, we'll drop the plug. And, um, you know, it, it's very possible that some coils behind it makes a lot of sense. I, that, again, the, the devices between when, when it started with Bob White and where we are today are vastly different. I tend to t aim towards an MVP more than anything, primarily because I've not seen recanalization. Now, I have no idea with <coughs> 7 to 9, the larger plugs, right? 1 to 3, 3 to 5 at a year, we've seen no recanalization. It's quick, it's elegant, and you're done. But again, the data may, may prove me wrong in a couple of years. I think uh, we're going to have to conclude this session. I really want to thank the panelists. I think this was a great session, uh, great cases, and uh, I think that the morning ICED and CIO sessions will be starting at 8 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you.